Now, welcome to another inspiring edition of Sound Insight with Dr. Tom Kern. Good morning. Welcome to Sound Insight. This is Tom Kern. It's great to be with you at the end of this incredibly hot week. Hi, Carrie. Hey, Tom. Speaking of incredibly hot. <laughs> Come on. That was good. You're laughing at me. Uh, you're funny. You didn't know that was coming. <laughs> I knew something's always coming. It's just, like, how, why does it still catch me off guard? <laughs> 20 years of marriage, honey. Come on now. Oh, that's good. You I get see, you. I wasn't looking at you. I was looking behind you Stop. at the reflection in Just the mirror. Stop. Incredibly hot, baby. <laughs> Incredibly hot. We'll be back in just a minute. We better go beyond what we're talking about right now. Let's get going. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, we do praise you and thank you. We love you. We adore you. We bless you. We ask, Lord, that you would take care of us as we... Uh, end this week as we move forward, Lord, to the 4th of July, to Independence Day. Lord, we proclaim our dependence upon you. And Lord, we not only want to depend on you, we want to be reliable, not only relying on you, but reliable, Lord, that you can look to us and you can say, yes, they have said yes to me. And so, Father, give us that grace today. We pray in Jesus' holy name. We ask for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, and we ask for your gracious protection upon those who travel. Lord our God, may they be kept safe and sound and cool in this heat. Amen. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, Father and the Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Okay, today in Sound Insight, we've got lots to cover. We have a story to, I guess, launch us, and it's going to bring out the two themes that we are going to discuss today on Sound Insight. I'm excited, Carrie. We've got lots of stories and lots of things that are going to help you, our wonderful listeners, our dear, uh, beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, to help you reflect on the concept of your identity and your mission. Who are you and what are you called to do in this world? And it all comes back to an iPhone. Our daughter Mary Grace's iPhone, two things that have jumped out to us in the last couple of weeks Really, I guess since the kids have been out of school, there are certain kinds of, and the, and the weather's gotten hotter and hotter. Uh, a couple of things have um, filled her feed on Instagram and Twitter. Well, I think the first week she was out of school, the first two weeks as the weather got nice, a lot of kids were posting that they wanted to get fit for summer and wanting to get abs and wanting to have these goals for a great body. And it was inspiring her. It actually was really cute. But it also was um, interesting just to see all the influence of how you're physically showing up, how your appearance is today during this hot summer. And, you know, you're obviously in shorts and a shirt that is more uh, revealing. And we didn't, I didn't really know all of this until Mary Grace was um, videoing our youngest daughter, uh, Liliana, oh, that's right. two years old, she was doing crunches. Well, all the ki- girls sit were working on their abs. <laughs> so, well, they were doing sit-ups, and they've been kind of careful about counting calories and exercising. And it's well, like, it's oh, been, now i got to do some crunches. i got to do some sit-ups. Good. I mean, we're trying to make them aware of, you know, when you eat food, what's involved as far as how many carbs, the protein, the fat content. And because sometimes they're just not aware. And so now it's, you know, we're doing swim, and some of them are – doing a little bit more um, tennis and just Soccer. just trying to help them be aware of being in, healthy. So the younger ones don't want to be left behind. No. So our too soon to be three year old Liliana, she started mimicking this by doing some some sit ups, and the kids it was so cute, so funny. It's you know to us, right? Well, okay. she takes this short video. It's like you know ten seconds long or less of doing sit ups, and she posts it onto Twitter. And she came back laughing about how many favorites she got because, you know, she was capturing the moment. She said something like, yeah, even my little sister's getting it, getting fit for summer. And it was just, it was naming what um, everybody was seeing, but maybe not capturing the essence of it so clearly the way an endearing short video of a two-year-old. Well, basically, Liliana could not do a sit-up. She struggles just to pull herself up with both hands and her neck and her head wrangling. And she just, it was the cutest thing. And that's why she posted it because I think Mary Grace wrote something like, this is my summer goals or summer goals, joking because it really was funny watching her try to do sit-ups. We were all hysterically laughing. Well, and the second thing, there was a second thing that popped out of these feeds and it was related to getting pictures uh, where kids were getting pictures with friends being someplace. Well, and I think what we noticed is we took her phone 
in reserve. She'll have it for just so many hours a day. And when I say hours, it's not like she's on it for several hours, but it's like you can have it for a half hour and then we pull it away or we say, go put it away. She's old enough to put her own phone away. But I can see there's sometimes where she'll be walking around looking on her phone or someone will buzz her or something will come in her um, auto messaging. And she gets continuously pulled away from home into the digital world, into what all her friends are doing, saying, messaging. And so that's why we just got to the point where Mary goes, just put your phone away from this time to this time, or at this time of day, you just need to not be on it. Or if I see her on it excessively, I just take it from her. I'm like, and she's the only one that has a phone, <clears throat> and she's a sophomore in high school now. But the point was, is that when you went to the sea, look at the photos that were often being shared. Well, it was just all about where everyone was, what barbecue you're at, what you know, fire pit you're at that night, making what s'mores. What kids were together. Well, yes. Where what they groups, were. They're at the, at the beach, at the lake, waves, at the po- at the, at the, on the amusement boat. park. And so there's this real sense, especially in summer, because you're not seeing everyone, that you're being left behind, that you're being left out, that there, everyone else is having a great time. All my <laughs> friends are. I, I tell you, how many times I heard my kids say, all, all my, my friends, friends are. And then I'll look at a picture, and it's an old picture from months ago of three of them someplace. That's a yeah. joke. It's not true. But it's, a, it's rarely the case. But the, the longing to belong, the longing to say, I have a place I fit in. I know who I am because I know whose I am. I know where I belong in that in that embed, embedding in relationships that is so deeply felt by kids in their tween years into their early teen years and adolescence. And so kids posting other pictures of, with other friends was really showing up quite strongly. Yeah, and I think not just with her, but also with our other c- girls as well, Tom. It just happens more in high school. There's more of a social quality to um, where everyone is and what everyone's doing. And it's not like these kids are doing something every single day or every single hour. But that one time, I think we had a couple of friends over and she was really making sure that they got a couple of photos of Snapchat. They were Snapchatting that they were all hanging out, which was kind of comical. And they then Snapchatted all the kids hanging out with them. So both of those incidents, those things of what's showing up in the social media became pointers to us that this concept of being fit, this concept of being in shape pointed Carrie and me to this concept of being in shape spiritually, that that idea of being called to spiritual growth, that call that we have to continue to uh, approach God in nearness and likeness, and yet at the same time, it's only when we're really uh, spiritually in shape that we're going to be useful to the Lord, that we're going to be reliable, relied upon. God can send us forth out into battle. And so much of that is related to what else? Where we belong, knowing our sense of identity. So that uh, that cutesy, simple example from social media is really pointing us to some fundamental spiritual themes for your life as a disciple and mine. Who am I? How do I stay rooted in my relationship with the Lord? And we're going to talk about that in terms of names in the second part of our program. Carrie and I are going to reflect a bit on our tradition and the scriptures uh, around the concept of your name. What's in a name? What's in your name? And in the first part of the program, we're going to break this open by sharing some stories associated with the idea of getting spiritually in shape. So, Carrie, you're looking at me. you got a <laughs> smile on your face. Are you ready to dive in? I'm ready. <laughs> These things come together. These things do fit together. I look at a scripture that is uh, in the Old Testament from the book of Genesis, where Jacob is wrestling with an angel. And you remember the story where Jacob... He doesn't take the initiative. He doesn't, you know, put, shake his fist at uh, heaven and say, "God, send down your strongest angel. I'm ready to wrestle with you. I'm ready to wrestle with you." But rather, he wrestles with God. Now, sometimes this is seen as a messenger from God. Sometimes it's from God, and I like that because somehow there's a way in which, when you want to understand what God is saying, you've got to wrestle with Him to understand His message. And as you know, Jacob wrestles the entire night, is unable to win. He's unable to overcome God, but neither will he stop. He can't um, achieve victory, but he will not relent. And and his continual um, battling uh, with God leads him to the place where he's going to be blessed. And the blessing that he asks for is to have his name revealed. That's the blessing. And so he believes that he is Jacob, 
and it comes to be the case that he wrestles to discover that he's really Israel. That's who he is, and it comes out of his relationship with God, his wrestling. Now, how did he even know that he wasn't Jacob? Like, how does one even become aware that they not are not who their parents named them to be, or there's more to their identity or their name than what they think? Was this a common tradition in the Jewish history? or? Well, I think this is something that we'll see, that in the encounter with God, someone, a major character, will come to discover a deeper, uh, there's a depth to who they are that is not known to them until it's revealed to them. So Abram becomes Abraham as a result of his act of faithfulness, trusting in God, even to the point of being willing to sacrifice Isaac. And so his, his obedience, his readiness, ready, his readiness to follow the Lord, even to the sacrifice of his son, literally became the occasion that God used to reveal to him, you know what? You are Abraham. You are going to be the father of many nations. And so that same, that same reality ends up being the case for a number of characters in the Old Testament and New so are we supposed to be wrestling for our true identity, our true call, our true... Ma- this is what you're saying. I don't know if this has been lived out in the Catholic faith, like currently. Am I just sounding like a really bad Catholic Christian? No, I think that, <laughs> you know, like... obviously we, as Catholics, we always think of Simon and Peter, and we think of Paul, Saul and Paul. You know, okay. those are the principal examples in the so New Testament. So only the really holy, holy people get renamed. <laughs> Right. That's well, so and, and so here's the thing. Is it is it that we're renamed or is it that our truest name, our truest what? Our truest identity is an identity that's only really known to us when we are in a life-giving relationship with God and God reveals it. Okay. And that makes sense, Tom. I feel like the more we fall into our mission as a person, the more we seek God and have these encounters with Him, the more He peels back or reveals to us, you know, that veil is thinned where we see who we really are called to be on this earth. I don't know how that transfers up to heaven, but I really feel like I really don't see fully who I'm called to be. I'm kind of stuck in the just me, (laughs) just my own uh, call mission of being the mom and wife and all the busyness that life holds that sometimes I'm just missing my call or my full identity or just be occupied with life. I mean, it really takes time and space to have that energy that to fully come to know who you are and what you are about. That's true. And there's this philosophical axiom, John Paul II loved to quote it, that action follows being, that who I am is going to give rise to actions or how I live. But he also said uh, that being follows action, that how you live is going to foster or form your sense of identity. And so, Carrie, that's something that I know that you and I have talked quite a bit about because I've focused a lot on how do I deepen my sense of identity, and you've focused quite a bit on how do I live my mission. And the answer is, of course, I'm right. Both. The answer is both. (laughs) The answer is both. That at times, you know, we might sit around and say, who am I? Well, get off the couch and move. Mm -hmm. Get out there and start acting. But sometimes we can be pouring ourselves out so much that there is no source that we're drawing from that we've we've neglected the going to the source the going to the to the well where mm-hmm. we're going to deepen that sense of identity this reminds me of um on a lot of the blogs i read these women will come up with a word to describe their year or a word they want to focus on for the year and it's something they get in prayer through discernment and just sensing I know you've done this, Tom. You either get like a one word, Tom, or you get like a phrase from scripture or some um, kind of message from spiritual fathers. And I think each year that slowly is kind of the uncovering, the revealing. And it, I just want to meet Jesus face to face and just be known. Who am I? <laughs> all this struggling and trying to figure it out and discern it. It can be fun. It can be like a mystery and adventure, trying to find out what our mission is as individuals, as a couple, as a family. But right now I'm just feeling really hot and it's just seeming like a lot of work. (laughs) So just tell me. (laughs) Well, you might like uh, Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. So she was a 19th century Discalced Carmelite and she lived, she was called to live a contemplative life of prayer. Well, what she ended up living was a significant life of suffering. So she suffered quite a bit, deep, I mean, horrible sicknesses that lasted extended periods of time. And she, in the midst of that, experienced as well deep, deep spiritual darkness. 
So how does that sound so far? I am just like, uh... yeah, what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> it has to do with the no. name that was revealed to her in her prayer. What is that name? I'll tell you in just a minute. Welcome back to Sound Insight. Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. She's known probably best of all because of a prayer she wrote about the Trinity. O Trinity, whom I adore. Uh, and it's actually quoted in the Catechism. It's one of the few prayers that you actually will find um, printed in the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the Trinity, uh, in that section at the first part of the Catechism on the Trinity. And uh, the, uh, the story is that as she went deeper and deeper into prayer, principally through a path of suffering and spiritual darkness in the midst of her contemplative vocation, uh, it literally was revealed to her. It came as an illumination or an enlightenment as she read Ephesians chapter 1, that there is a, uh, a simple brief phrase there, praise of his glory. And it was referring to that um, you know, we will be a praise of his glory in heaven as we praise his glory. She took it as a, a, a conduit whereby God was revealing to her, in heaven, your name will be praise of his glory. That that's, that's who you are in your deepest identity, you are a praise of his glory. Now, why that was so powerful and helpful to her, in part, was her life felt like anything but a praise of his glory. Her life was a life of spiritual darkness, no sense of God's presence, God's consolation, God's power, and yet she's living a life of a cloistered nun called upon to pray for hours and hours a day. And she would literally have to sometimes have to hold herself down from fleeing the chapel. The darkness was so deep. And many other times in her life for extended periods, she would suffer through this tremendous illness that would cause her to gain a substantial weight. And she was bedridden and just was in a miserable condition. And what would she cling to? I am a praise of his glory. I am a praise of his glory. I am a praise of his glory. Oh. I so, mean, talk about a sense of mission and identity. You know, she's, <laughs> I mean, just so far to the, I don't know, right of where we're dealing with our girls who are trying to find who am I, and they're on, you know, their feet saying, what am I about, and feeling like this emptiness and this ache, and, you know, they have all the comforts and niceties, and yet they're feeling no sense of um, real joy and truth. It reminds me of Psalm 16 where it says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And it's like, how do we help our kids know that his pleasures are forevermore, that it's in him that we really will find joy and have that encounter with Christ? Because obviously she wasn't in this um, state of just not having Christ touch her forever and ever. She had incredible moments of God's joy, vision, mystical experience. So she did have this supernatural encounter, which allowed her, it stretched her to go into the very darkness. It's almost like if you are going into the light and you come into, you know, the greater that you're able to walk in the light, the greater God allows you to walk in darkness just because he stretches you so much. And, well, and you know, um, uh, Carrie, another beautiful example of that was Mother Teresa. You know, yes, uh, as I was thinking Blessed of. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta. And she talked about that in her, um, in her early letters. Even early on, she talked about the, the call that she had um, that brought her into darkness. And she said that, that she, would, um, she would consider it um, a, you know, a tragedy to lose the, the sufferings and the crosses that she went through that in fact she was very joyful. There was no joy that she would not um, be able to experience. As, as, as great as the crosses and sufferings were, this would not take her away or discount her joy. So that those two themes that seem so antithetical, they seem so counter uh, to each other and, and opposed to each other. Oh, okay. You know, they're together. They're actually united together. Oh, because I thought you were saying that the saint did not experience the joy or she just was in deep pain and suffering. But I'm thinking of when we read um, about St. Faustina, how she did experience pain, but she also had such incredible spiritual encounters that it gave her the strength 
for the journey. It wasn't like she was just left on her own. Because right now I'm just feeling really mediocre in my faith walk. <laughs> just like I'm complaining about my kids wanting me to cook them five meals a day. And well, on the other day, know, I can remember I'm I came hot. home and you had uh, our. our a delightful two-year-old Liliana oh, had dis- yeah. discovered that she didn't like mazithra cheese that you bought specially, <laughs> and so she decided to pour it out all over the front steps. So I don't go. like it. Smells yucky. That's it what she said. Then I go up and she dumped the listerine, the whole bottle of listerine, on our carpet in the closet, and then she had taken the lipstick and. and it makes me sound like no one's watching this child all day long. She just kind of wanders around and gets into things, but then she took the lipstick and painted the whole side of my bed. With um, red, bright lipstick, which I didn't even notice till I Honey, woke up. Praise of the his next glory. Morning. <laughs> praise of his glory. Praise of his glory. Well, this is so silly. It's like, I don't, do I really have to spend my life, energy, and frustration, anger on these simple little things? It's like, I want to be building this great cathedral. I want to be doing this great mission of giving talks, or I want to be praying with people. And yet, I'm stuck failing in trying to wrestle with my toddler See, that's to, get, wrestling with God. to get her to go so to the God bathroom said. on the toilet and <laughs> get her to be toilet trained. It just seems funny. And when I think about, um, not these particular saints, but I just think of my, my faith journey, Tom, it just seems like before kids, it just seemed easier. Like I wasn't failing in so many human limits. And now with all these kids in life and summer, just the littlest of things are making me twinge or, you know, you can see my face contort across the table. <laughs> so another glass of milk is spilled. I'm like, oh. And it's like, so do you see how futile and like seemingly um, missionless this no, can no, feel see, for you mothers? Call it, so you called it futile. I would call it faithful. Faithful. Right? Well, God I guess is, faithful. is this how you see it? God, I mean, I God is a faithful see. hammer and he's given nine <laughs> chisels to you. So write that down, dear. Hallelujah. Just that up. Yeah, praise of his glory. Nine chisels. Oh. They all have names and they run around our house and they're there to chisel you. Well, and I think this is what society will tell us. They will try to bring us down and say that, you know, it's not worth your time. It's not worth effort. You're home with these kids. You should just ha- hire someone and then you can really produce or have a fulfilling life if you go have a, you know, a career that's not a bad career. It would be a, f- believe me, I think it's almost easier for me to go teach school every day and be with a bunch of kids that listen to me and actually respect <laughs> my authority and we can actually make progress during the day versus being at home, you're looking at me laughing. But it's true. Do you see that there's just this constant battle of mothers and how do I feel mission-minded and, and find joy in this call? I, I feel like we're talking about this topic, like, didn't we just talk about this two months ago? <laughs> well, and I think, um, you know, parents or moms, if you're talking specifically about moms at home or dads at home right now, one of their big challenges is where do I see spiritual progress in the midst of seemingly uh, regression or a mess or daily challenges and difficulties? Where yeah. do I see progress in the midst of the same daily challenges? Well, looks like yes. the same thing. And sometimes, Tom, I just think of um, I was weeding the other day, and those those really obnoxious weeds that are like all thorny. Um, I don't even know what they're called, but you can't touch them. You have to actually literally take a shovel and go down into the ground at the root and like. Uh, break it because the root goes down so deep. And I was thinking these are like areas or addictions in our life where these roots are really deep and you go to try to pull them and you're going to get pricked. And sometimes I'll see my kids, you know, falling into a really bad habit or an area. And I want to just go uproot that sin in their life or that attitude. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, God has timing. He has his wisdom. He wants to give me mercy. He's like, no, you you have to be very careful how you try to uproot that. Otherwise, the root is going to go even deeper. <laughs> then it's going to come back stronger the next season. I mean, I know it's a little digression from what we were talking about, but But what that just, leads wow. to is very much this conversation about spiritual training. Right, if we we need to be spiritually fit, if you will, yes. in order to take on the challenges that are right in front of us, right? Whether or not we want them, you know, Jesus sent out his uh, apostles and disciples two by two, and they would go off and they would do their activity, missionary activity, and then they would come back. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, "Okay, now take a break. Let's come away for a while." Unfortunately, dear, the two he sent us off two by two into a home with a bunch of kids. <laughs> That's our mission and field. Our mission field doesn't leave us. 
So we stay yeah, we on stay. Mission Field. <laughs> Don't get to go to Hawaii Sorry, for a dear. week. Yeah. I Carrie think it's has, about that. I think it's about time for us to go away for a weekend and leave the kids with yeah. the babysitter. Carrie has talked about going away to Hawaii um, for five days. I know. For about ten when years. When our 25th wedding anniversary is coming up, yeah. I just keep long-term goals, the light at the end of the tunnel. Honey, it's it called helps heaven. Me. We got heaven. Okay. <laughs> but truly, Tom, I, I love this. That um, you know, it is this time of summer, and I feel like summer has come sooner because of the heat, because of the beautiful weather. And it's not even 4th of July. And I feel like we've had a really full month of just activities and togetherness and outings. And it's like, wow, we still have a full two months left. It is not uh, too late to find time to get away with your spouse and really go on retreat find uh, an overnight somehow just to say, yes, we are on mission two by two. We do need respite. We do need time to strengthen and to fall in love and to appreciate and celebrate each other because marriage is so important. And us being that example to our kids is just critical. And sometimes I think, ah, Lord, you want us to to radiate Jesus's love. And I'm like, gosh, I don't know if I always do that. I, I see the ways in which I really fall short loving you and be in a light of who Jesus is to us or to our kids. And when you said falling short of loving you, did you mean God or did you mean me? Oh, it's both. Okay, okay. Let's just, kind of, let's just put, put it out there. there. I just wonder. I just, just kind of <laughs> clarification. Sake. You said you. You pointed at me, but your eyes this were is, rolling up you, to heaven. So. This is our constant struggle is I yeah. desire so much more, and yet I see how I fall short. I mean, that's well, my... That's it, but that's the spiritual <sighs> path, yeah. is that our spiritual path runs on desire, and that desire is, is called love. You know, that longing to become the one God sees us to be in his eyes. I, one of the things we were talking about as we were getting ready for this program about spiritual training in our, spirit, in, in, in our family life is that uh, physical training, you know, we're using that as the example because a lot of our kids are involved in that, and I've been involved in that now for the last month and a half. You are becoming a nice trying hard. specimen almost there, honey. Two months, <laughs> Very yeah, nice. been, almost two months uh, that I've been... I'm working at it, and I'm down 25 pounds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And you have a nice tan. You got the nice hair. You're looking well, really good, Tom. This is good. Thanks, I think dear. it's time to go away for a Carrie, weekend. I, there was that kind of like, the, the voice went up at the end of that sentence. You're looking really good, Tom. Like, oh, that's it's a, excitement. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it was excitement. We'll, we'll listen to the recording. But it's one of those things where we contrast um, what we do, what we, we know what it takes to improve our situation physically. We yeah. get it. Diet and exercise. Eat right, exercise. Healthy eating lifestyle and fit in regular exercise that is well-managed, blah, blah, blah. And, and, but I think there are some tricks in that. It's like when Mary Grace went to do that run and she had a little bit of a zip fizz. <laughs> I said, here, try half a zip fizz. And then I, um, I well, gave her music. I said, you really, if you can listen to music, it'd be so great. So little tricks to help. Well, and... What you're pointing to, Carrie, is the fact that if we can use some of those handholds, we can do more than we've done and more even maybe than we imagine, right? You, you said uh, that uh, one of the things that we expect is that we expect to have to, to work out hard in order to improve ourselves physically. If you want to become physically fit, it's going to take some serious effort. And especially as we get older. It's going to take some focus. It takes even more It's effort. going to take energy. you got to make some space for it. you got to make time for it, etc. But do we think about that when it comes to spiritual growth? I think that spiritual growth, we think, turn on the sprinkler in the morning, and the spiritual flowers are going to emerge, <laughs> and I'll be more humble by daytime, the end of the day. I know. I think if I just I'll go to holier. Mass, I'll be holier. And yet sometimes I'll come out of Mass and just kind of be like, oh, I missed the essence, the heart of what was going on, just because my mind wasn't really striving, wrestling for God's blessing. So, so the, first, the first principle that we want to draw out here is it's going to take some serious effort. If you intend to grow spiritually, and God, God's on your side on that, expect that it's going to take some serious effort to I, get there. I don't find that encouraging. I just, yeah. <laughs> I just like, why? you know what I'm saying? I don't okay, want to be so, discouraging, but... Well, it's like, really? I have to work even harder at this? Now let's go back to that Mary Grace example. What you're talking about are a couple of handholds that you gave, zip fizz and music. And a half a zip fizz, because I don't want to think, a, people think we're drugging our kids and giving them, you know, high energy drinks. I just said, here, t try this little bit in the afternoon. And so, yeah, anyhow. Like 20 minutes before you run. 
and put on some, get some like a good music in your iPod and go running. Now, Mary Grace had typically run about two, two to three miles in that range. And, and uh, she hates running. And she hates running, and and she, you know, it's it's a labor. For I mean, her to hate run. is a strong word, but she yeah, really, really doesn't like it. And she desires it. I mean, she desires to like it. She'll read. Run, I checked out like five Running World magazine uh, magazines for her. Just I thought if we read these articles and look at the pictures, it'll somehow motivate and inspire us. Which it actually no, it works. Really, it's just painful. I hate running. I mean, <laughs> I really don't like running at all. I just I do it. Because I want to be fit, right? Uh, okay, that's just so, so painful because I really enjoy it. And okay. <laughs> we're the opposite. We do it for different reasons. Anyhow. So uh, Mary Grace, this particular time, had the music. And she you know, had that iPod all teed up, that nice line of music that she was going to listen to. And she did her Zip Fizz about 20 minutes before she ran. She'd never done those things before. Yep, she'd never done those things before. And off she went. And sometimes she would run with her sister as an encouragement. But this time she went off by herself. And um, and we were waiting for her to come home. And, and what ended up happening? Well, I'll tell you in just a minute. <laughs> well, welcome back to the program. Talking about Mary Grace having gone running, normally two to three miles, sometimes with her sister, to try to encourage her to stay the course. This time she runs with an iPod and with a little zip fizz in her to get her going. And after about an hour, I I said, sent you out. No, I sent you I said, you Carrie, out. where's Mary Grace? Oh, you were coming home from the office, and I yeah. said, you know, Tom, Mary Grace hasn't shown up. We were having dinner. I'm concerned something happened to her, like maybe she sprained her ankle or I don't know, something, because that was really a long time. Right. So I, I got on the car, and, and I drove around a little bit, and then I got a call from you, and you said, come on home. And I got home, and Mary Grace was standing on the front steps waiting for me, and she had this smile on her face, and I said, what? Where were you? She said, Dad, I ran this really long route, way longer than I'd run before. She was so excited. She wouldn't even let me get in the house. We went right over to the computer, and we went to a, a website where you can, it's called Map My Run. And it uses Google Maps, and, and we tracked her entire run, the entire distance she went. And come to find out, she went 6.2 miles. Woo-hoo! Now, do you know what 6.2 miles is? Carrie? Um, I've heard you guys mention a 10K. It's a 10K. A, exactly. It's exactly 10K. So 10K is 6.2 miles. And Mary Grace had run 6.2 miles. She was so excited. Elated. I mean, she's like, okay, we're going to go run tomorrow. I'm going to run. <laughs> and, and the thing was this, is that not only was she just elated and delighted at what she had done, and she was telling the story and telling the story, she said, I had no idea this was in me. I, I, and and she was laughing at the idea that she had only done a two to three mile run. Now she was kind of snubbing her nose at it, and I'm like, okay, slow down there, Tiger. <laughs> you know. Now she was looking at marathons. When's the Boston Marathon? Oh, she wasn't. I was she wasn't doing that. Funny time. But it was a 10k. All of a sudden, she's like, I have a 10k inside of me. That's what I have. I've got a 10k inside of me, and it was like, it was always there. She just didn't realize it. She needed some of those handholds, zip fizz and the music, handholds to help her go to a place she had not gone before. And that's what the Lord gives to us in our own spiritual training. He gives us some handholds to help us be able to advance maybe far beyond where we would have expected. So we want to unfold some of what our tradition puts before us as spiritual handholds. Now, one of them. Good, Carrie. Do you want to? No, I'm just wondering what the zip fizz is. For what spirit- is the spiritual <laughs> zip fizz? Okay, so just, you know the two that I'm excited. I want. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say because I really don't know. Okay, so th- the first two are going to be the sources of the uh, most powerful um, strength that comes from God. Those are the sacraments, and so those two sacraments that are associated with our daily walk with God are, as you can imagine confession, and mass, or receiving Holy Communion. Uh, Our Holy Communion is called what? Our daily bread. And so if we want to receive a strength that comes from God, mass and regular confession will be those sources of the very life of God soaring and and, and, um, surging in our spiritual lives. Now, we hear that and we're like, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was expecting something new and exciting and fresh. But that's where we need to learn how to brush off some of the 
the cobwebs in our minds and hearts that are really truly available to us, especially if we're willing to, to go to Mass, and then we become more aware of our need to go to confession, frankly. Amen. Well, and I think, Tom, you mentioned it as the Euch- going to the Mass, experiencing Eucharist, but within that, there are handholds. There is, you know, getting the Magnificat and having those readings and doing some reflection. There is a way in which I feel like I could be more mind... Okay, you talk about running and how you have to get in this mindset, and you have to put it into your day, otherwise it doesn't happen, and you're going to feel some resistance, and you have to be, you know, your stomach has to feel a certain way. You can't just run right after you eat a full meal, so you have to actually kind of get into the mood, the spirit of running. I think that if I were to, with the mindset of saying, I'm going to get in spiritual shape, then I'm going to go to Mass, I'm going to leave all the kids home <laughs> with their, sis- their siblings, and I'm going to purchase this Magnificat. I'm going to um, really try to say, Lord, I want to spend this month of July getting in shape. And I mentioned this last week that I felt this tug and this call and had a dream that I'm supposed to go to Mass. I still have not made it to daily Mass. And I say, you know, Lord, I really want something to be revealed about who I am in your eyes and who, you know, more about what my mission is as a mom, wife, and daughter. Um, I feel like those little, just those simple two things of, of getting in your mindset, bringing along that book that you can hold on to and write in and grab at any, you know, just what was that word again? What was God's word in that that reading? And go with a prayerful heart and ask the Lord to really come into me. Um, into my heart. I just feel like he's going to meet me. I don't feel like he's going to say, yeah, just keep it up. It's going to take you about another three weeks for me to connect with you. And I I have to say this. We were at Mass on Sunday, and um, the Gloria, I don't know if you noticed this, the the choir wasn't singing, but I was singing at the top of my voice, as loud as I could, the Gloria. And I just felt this incredible spirit of praise. And I could not hear my own voice, except for, you know, towards the end of each... I don't know, phrase. I could hear some of my voice. But the people around us were singing so loudly. I don't know if you get the real good Catholics that go in the summer. (laughs) But I was so impressed and so proud of our faith community at that point, where I just started to reflect on the fact that here I was with my kids, and we were singing, and I could not hear my own voice. That's how loud the parishioners were singing in our parish. And it's not how loud the organ was playing or how loud the um, vocalist was singing. It really was this beautiful worship. It was the same Gloria that we used to stay, sing at Franciscan University. And um, I just felt this beautiful sense of worship and Mass. Now, I don't always experience that. And I always, I mean, I don't want to, you know, you can only experience so much through the music. I don't want to be limited by God's grace and power. He can speak and work in our hearts, even when there's, you know, not a great homily, or even when the, the music isn't so great. God is going to be breaking through all those limits we put on Him. If we just wrestle, <laughs> wrestle Him and say, Lord, we need you. I need that faith. I need that bolstering. I don't want to be spiritually um, overweight or spiritually bogged down. And I really feel like he will answer our call in ways we could never imagine or dream. And we'll be like Mary Grace. I never knew I had this great spiritual beauty depth within me. I just never knew it was there because I never made it a real focus point. Now, I'm a mom with a lot of kids, so I have a lot of excuses as to why I don't take my spirituality more seriously and try to get spiritually fit. But I really feel like this is a great program time. I love how this is moving us into a call to do spiritual training, especially in the summer when we have those extra hours of light, extra hours of of space. Not that it's, my life is easier because all the kids are home, but I just feel like there's more. you're present a little bit more and there's more helpers at home to try to just organize that schedule or that day around getting spiritually fit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son. That's my sermon for the day. That was beautiful, Carrie. (laughs) And and the ultimate fruit of that is that our union with God will grow, and God will grow bigger. God will become bigger to us. It's not just that our spiritual life gets bigger. God increases. There's a beautiful uh, way that is spelled out in a... the uh, Prince Caspian, that book by C.S. Lewis. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a scene in Prince Caspian where Aslan meets Lucy. And he says to her, welcome, child. And she says, Aslan, you're bigger. And then he answers, that's because you're older, little one. And then she said, not because you are. And then his answer was, I am not. But every, wh- every year you grow you will find me bigger. Every year you grow, 
you will find me bigger. And that's the, the, the beauty of our spiritual life and spiritual training is that God will get bigger. God will become, uh, his, his fatherliness will grow. What it means that he's Lord will grow. What it means that he is holy will increase. What it means that he, has, uh, he, he is glorious and majestic and loving. He is merciful. All of that will increase as we approach him in nearness and likeness. Amen. I feel like him as creator and just that he is the creator of who we are, creator of life, creator of all that. I mean, I look at all the people around me and think, how did God create all of us and loves us each unconditionally? It just breaks any kind of mindset I have about who God is. And we, again, try to contain him. And it's, no, I don't want him to be contained in me. I want, with what we're dealing with in our culture today, I want God to break free in the fullness of his truth and love in our lives. Well, when we come back, Carrie, uh, I want to talk about two situations. One is um, the concept of moderation. And the other is the, is the question, should you let one of your children go to another church, a church that's not Catholic? Because we're facing that right now and Carrie, I like, I like the dialogue we've had and the answer that we've come up with. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Sound Insight. It is great to be with you today. And we were talking a bit about spiritual training, spiritual formation, spiritual growth, getting spiritually fit. And, and we're doing so both as a, a way to come to a deeper sense of our own identity, who we are in God, but also in order to be equipped and ready and, and be able to be relied upon by God as we are sent forth on mission. And one of the things that, again, that we should expect as we're along the way are not only that we are going to experience some of that resistance within us, but we're also going to experience unexpected attacks. The devil can be kind of like a wasp. And unfortunately, I I wasn't there when it happened. But Carrie, what happened in the current home? The devil, the wasp. Are you going to tie this into the I am. It's all spiritual, honey. So uh, I just had a... Tom was out doing um, some work for the ministry. And late at night, we were watering the lawn. It was really dark um, because we were starting to water a little bit later. And my son came out to get his shoes and socks, and he started screaming like, something bit me. I mean, but screaming like I've never heard him scream. A nine-year-old. Or, yeah. yeah, I sel- seldom hear him scream this song. And so I run over, and we're the only ones out there at the time. I go, what is it, John Mark? What's wrong? He goes, something bit me. I don't know. It's a bee. I'm like, it couldn't have been a bee. There's no bees out. I'm thinking this in my head. I'm not telling this to him. I'm just trying to say, John Mark, you're okay. You're okay. It's all right. And he just cannot control his his um, pain. So this draws six other kids out to the backyard and the little ones come out with Mary Grace and Amory and, or no, Amory is sleeping, um, Mary Catherine and John Mark or John Luke. And then within five seconds, John Luke starts screaming like a blood curl scream. I've never heard him scream like this. And he's like, it's eating me. It's biting me. It's... And I'm like, what is he talking about? And we're all looking and at him old, yeah. and it's dark. So we can't see fully what's going on. And I run, he's down at the, at the deck. So I have to run from our, our grass down the steps to where he is. And there on, the, on his neck is a wasp, a bee, just biting into him like it was clinging onto his neck. So I flick it off and he's uncontrollable screaming. Like I've never heard. I thought there was a hornet's nest or something like a swarm any minute going to descend on all my kids. I'm like, everybody in the house, shut the door, (laughs) shut the windows. So they all come running in and the boys are screaming in pain. And so I'm quickly thinking, okay, grab ice, get the baking soda and water, make that, you know, paste that you would stick on it. Grab some Benadryl. I'm thinking, you know, because here this... I didn't know if it was bees. I didn't know if it was multiple bees stinging them. I didn't know. I didn't realize at the time that it was a wasp. I thought it was just a bumblebee. But of course, we Google, Googled everything. What to do when you get bit by a wasp. What to do when you, how to relieve the pain. (laughs) I I love it. I didn't have to call the doctor. I didn't have to wait for anybody. But it was almost to the point, Tom, where I was going to take them to the ER. That's how much pain they were in. I really was like panicked for about two minutes as a mom going, I've just never seen them this thrown by this attack. But eventually we learned it was, I just believe, one wasp that bit them four times. Well, and so when I think about how that relates to our spiritual lives, we have to be aware that sometimes there are things going on in our lives or the lives of those we love that can seem rather small, rather insignificant, or just invisible to us. We just don't see it. We're in the dark, literally, Mm -hmm. but they are in pain. Tom, I like how you're tying this in. I'm seeing this 
analogy just coming to life here. And when they're in pain, right, you you can say to them, oh, we want you to focus on the spiritual life. Like you could not have said to John Mark, go clean your room or John Luke, be kind to your sister and do your chore. They're just in too much pain. It was hard for us to be uh, near to, you know, what was that caused it? Was it their fault or were they just a victim of something? But there are so many people walking around right now with spiritual bee stings. And those spiritual bee stings are just keeping them literally paralyzed in their spiritual lives from being able to move forward. And until we can bring them something that can calm them and help them to deal with the pain of the situation they're in, they're not going to be able to move forward. So my hope and prayer is that those of you that are listening today that are maybe feeling a bit overwhelmed by a challenge to focus more and do more, to grow spiritually, to address what's going on in your spiritual lives, and you're feeling like just another burden has been thrown on to me, you know what? You might be someone who has been spiritually stung, and spiritually stung in a way that's just paralyzing you. And the Lord is not saying, go run a marathon, go clean, you know, go deal with your chores and your your duties. No. Let the Lord minister to you. Let him be a good Samaritan. Let him be a good, let him put the oil, uh, pour the oil over the wound that has left you beaten up on the side of the road. That's your first call, is let him be a father to you. Let Jesus be a merciful and good shepherd to you. You know, let him anoint your head with oil. Let your, let your cup overflow. Let him lead you to green pastures. You know, who wants to sign up for that? You know, I do. That's what I want to sign up for uh, in those places in our lives where we've been spiritually stung. So if that means for you, you're spiritually stung because you put your hand in the wasp's nest, go to confession. You know, don't walk around in that spiritual pain. Don't hide. Let the divine physician heal you. But if it's something else, let the Lord in. Ask the Lord today to, to be a healing balm for your wounds. He really, truly does want to do that. Yeah, and Tom, sometimes we don't even know what it is that's causing that pain. We don't realize what it is and how we were raised or some disposition within us, and we just don't have that insight. And it's not until we further research it or let the Holy Spirit reveal it to us or get spiritual guidance. Like well, we, sometimes you get healed without even knowing what it is. And and that's part of that that's the power of healing in contemplative prayer. Speaking of Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. You know, sometimes you just go sit in his presence yes. and the Lord will begin to wash over you, wash over you, wash over you and slowly begin to have a, a new light dawn in your heart. I just don't feel like the Lord wants us to stay in mediocrity or in pain. Or I in really, darkness. Yeah. Or I just, he really wants to bring us into the light. He really wants us to come into a place where we can have that peace. Okay, let's talk about this now. Okay, so um, we're a pretty Catholic family, huh? Our kids would say we're pretty extreme in our Catholicism compared to their friends, unfortunately. Well, our daughter, Mary Grace, has met uh, a friend in her driver's ed course. And again, following her on uh, Instagram, discovered this girl's Christian. And then she went over her house a couple days ago. And this girl's pretty overt about her Christian faith. And Hallelujah. She, she we need more of that. <laughs> she invited you. Mary Grace to come to her church. And Mary Grace said, well, thank you, but you know I'm Catholic. And, um, and I'm, you know, but she said, you know, you're still invited. It's praise and worship and there's preaching and there's a lot of young people there, a lot of people our age. And so she mentioned this to you and to me individually. And I think she was wondering how are we going to respond? And so uh, a lot of folks out there, maybe more in the summer even, are going to be faced with, you know, kids that are, you know, growing up in an intentional Catholic home, but now are being invited to a church experience that is going to be maybe more entertaining, maybe involving praise and worship, maybe involving a specific invitation to give their life to Jesus, uh, you know, these sorts of things. Well, for me, Tom, it was just growing up here in the Northwest, if, you know, we could have the opportunity to come to faith and prayer and hear the Word of God, I was like all for that as a youth. I needed all the support and, and, and those mentors that I could look to that would help me grow in my faith. So when I when you told me this, I go, great, she's going to go hear about Jesus and draw closer to him and praise him. I thought, that's awesome. It's not like I felt like she was going to be pulled away from the faith, but even if she had questions about a faith, it would only 
strengthen those questions and help her discover, oh, why do we pray to Mary, or why do we believe the Eucharist is the real body of Christ? So I thought, oh, it's a great opportunity. She's in the home. It's perfect. And I was just well, excited. Well, dunking her into Steubenville <laughs> Northwest and uh, hey, Ignite I was... Your Torch and For Us and CYO Camps and Catholic Family Camp. Tom, I was so. excited that she had a friend who invited her to church. I'm like, where are her Catholic friends who are saying, Mary Grace, let's go do mission. Let's go have a prayer meeting. Let's go or Mary Grace, to adoration. Are you inviting your let's friends go to church, to, right? confirm, to go to confession. Yeah, I mean, it's just awesome to see this evangelistic spirit coming from this young girl. I was really, and I hopefully she'll bolster Mary Grace in her faith and help her to take a better stand um, because it's hard to be um, a Catholic and be a strong, faithful Catholic and not feel like you might lose some of your friends, especially if you're trying to kind of keep it cool. And that's kind of sad, right? But that's, that's, it is what it is. And so um, we encourage you to if, if that's the situation that you're, um, you're facing with your family, well, number one, look into the church. Make sure it's not anti-Catholic. Number two, you may even want to go check it out yourself in advance. Number three, uh, make sure that your daughter or son is getting exposed to young people in the Catholic church where they can experience something, maybe not exactly the same, but something that can help them grow in faith as well, like some of those things that we've mentioned. Hey, we're out of time for now, but we pray God's blessings on your day. Please stay cool and enjoy Happy Fourth of July. Independence Day. Yay. God bless you.